that work? Any clothes left over there? Not now. Not now? Uh, good job to Tiffany and Jenny putting that all together. Amen. Um, then go get over there and see. It looked like, as I said, it's more than like more built in the apartment store just about. Uh, I never I never thought there'd be clothes that have been brought up here to give away. And there's a lot of stuff given away. And there's a lot of stuff left too. So uh, we'll hear later on what we're gonna do with the rest of it. You wanna do it again after Christmas? After Christmas or after Thanksgiving? I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll get the word. Anyway, uh, we had a great afternoon, a pretty weather. Uh, just pray for Pete and Myrna because they were in a little accident, uh, a little bend the fender uh, when they was leaving this morning. You know, if you go out this right over here, it's, it's, it's tough looking over this hill coming here and someone's flying. Um, there were some blessings in that. It could have been a whole lot worse. As soon as Myrna pulled out, she saw the car coming probably, and she stayed in this left lane, number one, if she hadn't, then this car would have rear ended her down. Yeah. The next one is that God blessed that there wasn't anything coming from this side. Yeah. So if this happened, just happened to be kind of a clip thing. Uh, nobody got hurt, so just keep me in prayers. If you would, turn to number 438, so in a while, heaven came down and glory filled his soul. We're going to sing all all uh, three verses, 438, that's right, yeah. Heaven came down, all three verses and all three courses. Join us as we sing. <laughs>
tell the turkeys, oh, you're good now. <coughs> I'm not worried to know where that barrel's coming from. 957 in the blue book. This world is not my home, and thank God for that. Yeah. It'd be a bad place. I know uh, Larkin this morning was telling about the utopia, and we'll never have another utopia here on earth. Uh, you know, man tries. But uh, the only utopia I know is going to be the Garden of Eden and one heaven. And as I said, this one, God made both of them. So, 957, this world is not my home, in the blue book. All three verses and all three courses again. <laughs> And we're going to sing all three verses together.
Let's pray, please. Brother Mike Palicka, could I get you these in prayer, please, sir? Father, we love you, and it's been a joy and a blessing to be in your house tonight. Fellowship and work with my brothers and sisters here to preach in your word and teaching you the word, Father. We thank you for the bringing peace and love through that close call of the day yep. and for the other uh, blessings that you've given us for, for the week. We also have some we missed up that's uh, facing uh, surgery. We pray for those, Father, and those that are on the road traveling with those up here also. Father, I pray for Brother Kyle as he prays the bread of life to us tonight, that we will open our minds and our hearts to the word you have for us there, and that it touch the hearts of, of, the, of us here tonight. And if there's anybody here that doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray tonight would be the night of our salvation. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ronnie. Amen. Miss Charlotte, she's already down there. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, this is a song that was given me back in the early 90s. Church was leading music in there, Robert. A uh, lady came up to me and said, this is one of her favorite songs, and she never could sing it. So she gave it to me and said, beautiful song. Uh, and paddle I found the lily in my valley. Uh, how many of you have ever heard that before? Y'all know the words? Oh, shucks. <laughs> That means I got to know them too. <laughs> so, great song. It's uh, uh, just praise you get a blessing from it. Uh, here goes. <clears throat> You'll be 
Turn it in your Bible <laughs> to, books, to the book of Zechariah. We're going to spend most of our time here. I am going to reference back to the passage in the book of Genesis in a bit, and then also in the book of Hebrews. Um, <clears throat> I want to tonight, I want to uh, look at the events surrounding the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's a uh, far more complex than Christ setting his foot down okay, on the mount. Um, that's typically what people think of, um, what they've heard, and they just, Christ comes and, and dig, and I'm going to use this term because it's incorrect, that descends to the mount, puts his foot down, and says, okay, it's all over, y'all settle down, okay, and we're going, everything's going to change, and that's not at all what happens. You better get my Bible open. There are a number of events that take place that, shall we say, people refer to and, and kind of fit together as the second coming. There are things that occur, we'll get right into that in just a moment, um, there are things that occur just prior to, and that's where we're going to start, um, the second coming. And there are things that, shall we say, um, are a result of we need to, because of the significance of the second coming, the significance of Christ's return, the significance of God's fulfilling prophecy, the significance of God's promises to the nation of Israel, we need to start actually okay, into the holy place of Zechariah. Let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. I know that, that we have referenced this passage many times in our, in our study of things to come through the last several months, but uh, without an understanding of what is what God is had had intended, what His will for the nation of Israel was from the beginning, and what He intends to do, um, you, you you cannot understand what's happening. You cannot understand uh, the the reason for the second coming of Jesus Christ. I start out tonight in, in saying that one of the things that that troubles me and and is sometimes people's um, that profess to be Christians, and I'm going to, to use that term, mm -hmm. but people that profess to be Christians but yet hate the nation of Israel. Yep. <clears throat> and uh, I have run into this uh, personally over the years. I'm trying to be careful because I know this is being recorded, but I've, I've had people in churches prior to this that uh, that that not just disagree, but I'm talking about to the to the point of physical violence made it well known their hatred for the nation of Israel. And that uh, I was a fool to believe in it. Folks, we need to understand something. God is not finished with the nation of Israel. Amen. He will do what he promised them he would do. And, uh, and they shall be, and, I'm, and, and listen to this term, listen to it carefully with a spiritual ear. We'll get to the explanation in a bit. There's coming a day when all of Israel will be saved. Amen. Now, some of you say, I don't understand that. I didn't want you to understand that. I'm going to give you the explanation here in just a bit. But that's, that's the scriptural view. And that all takes place in and around the second coming of Jesus Christ. In Genesis chapter 12, okay, in 2090, 2090 B.C., God is speaking to Abraham here in chapter 12. Let me read through several verses here. He says, Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house, 
unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and will bless thee, and will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. Stopping right there. One of the things that we're going to take a look at, and this will be after Thanksgiving in the weeks to come, but we're going to look, what, look at what is described in Scripture as the sheep-goat judgment. And remember that its, that its source is in this verse right here. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee, through Israel, through the seed of Abraham, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Moving on down to verse number 7. It says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now let's move to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. Chapters 12, 13, and 14 of Zechariah. We're not going to take the time to, to go through all of this. It's just primarily a small part here tonight. Oftentimes in the book of Revelation, the, the chapters are not necessarily in relation, especially as you get into to, to the mid to latter chapters, they're not chronological in exact events. There's also some back and forth here of this happens, this happens, this happens. And you might find it in Zechariah chapter 12, you might find it in 14. Now, a few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we looked at, on Sunday morning, the Battle of Armageddon. And one of the things, if you'll remember there, in, in some of the passages there are in chapter 19, but one of the important parts in, in, in beginning to get an understanding of the Battle of Armageddon is that it's God that brought the nations there in the first place. Okay. Certainly, the, the one, as we looked earlier in the bold judgments, and again, as the demons were released, again, they went into the kings of the nations, and, and again, in the, in the human sense, they convinced them to gather their armies, but it's the one that God is putting it in their hearts to do so. He's the one who put the hooks in their jaws and brought them, okay, to Israel. Okay. We talked about the valley there of Megiddo, um, of Armageddon, we talked the Valley of Jehoshaphat, we talked about the 200 length, mile length valley, we talked about the blood there that was to the level of the horse's bridles, okay, and that in itself is, is the initial point where Christ will return to this earth, okay, and I'm trying not to confuse you here with the, with the term return, but that's where Christ will return with his saints, meaning you and me, Remember we talked about that you, we will be behind him on a horse. We won't have to do nothing. Mike or Lickley, you'll never have to take your sword out. Just lean back and hold on and watch. Okay? Some of you say, well, I can't ride a horse worth a flip. That's one of the reasons why we'll need a glorified body is be able to hold on to them horses, okay? You know, it's a long way from up there all the way down to here. That's a quick ride, all right? We couldn't do that in this place. Some of you might think you can ride a horse, but you can't. Not like that. All right? But that's the initial returning spot. Now, let's, let's get that in our minds. Let's, as Christ descends there to the Valley of Jehoshaphat in this battle that's taking place, okay, let's on our, with our DDR freeze, pause. And while that action is beginning and taking place, we need to understand something. We're fixing to get into Zechariah chapter 14 here in just a minute. These armies that have been gathered, okay, the entire, let's say the 100%, all of them have not piled into the valley yet. As Christ is about to leave, come down. Some of them are in Jerusalem at this point. Okay? Jerusalem is being attacked. The battle of Armageddon is in two phases. The valley of Jehoshaphat, and then you have the other battle that's going on in Jerusalem itself. 
That, there's much talk here in, in Zechariah 12 and 13 and in, in, verse, in chapter 14. So let's start our reading here in chapter 14. Chapter, Zechariah 14, verse number 1, says, Behold, and then we see this phrase, and it's used in a way that it's not used anywhere else in Scripture other than passages that talk about this context. We see it in the book of Joel as well. But we see a phrase that says, the day of the Lord cometh. Now, as we look at this phrase, immediately in our mind, we may and probably will, we think of, well, the day of the Lord is typically a phrase that speaks of the tribulation period. Okay? The, 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 the wrath of God during that time period. And you know what? You'd be wrong. Okay? But let's look at this in a little different way here. As we, when we first started our study in things to come, in looking back at Genesis chapter 12, in looking back, and I'm kind of moving back chronologically, we, we look back to Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15, okay, the promise of, of the seed. Okay, we, we look back there to, to Satan as he, Lucifer, um, and again, we're prior to that, and he falls from heaven. But we also see there where, where Satan and the serpent there, where, where Eve is tempted. All of these things. And it sets in motion, although I don't like that term, a series of events that has been taking place for 6,000 years. And for 6,000 years, Satan has been warring against God has hated God, has attacked God, has attacked God's people, has attacked God's children, has attacked, and we, we went through list after list after list of, of, of groups of Jews and times when God tried, when, excuse me, when Satan tried to wipe um, the seed of woman off of the earth. We, we've looked at all those things. But I'm trying to put this stuff in mind because through those years, through those centuries, Satan attacked and tried to destroy. <clears throat> destroy. And destroy. Amen. And what we see with the second coming is a designated point in time after the end of all of the, 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 the trumpet judgments, the, 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 the vile judgments, the sealed judgments in the, in the seven year tribulation period. At the final very end of all those things, the Lamb will return as a lion. And at this point, it is as though God is making a declaration. Satan, your time has ended. In the sense of you've had your day. Your day to seek and destroy. Your day to manipulate people. Your day to deceive. All of these things. But it's going to end. And so that is what's meant here by, in this context, the day of the Lord coming. It says, and thy spoil, okay, at this point we're talking thy, thy here is Jerusalem. The people of Jerusalem, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. It says, and thy spoil, okay, possessions shall be divided in the midst of thee. Remember the armies are inside Jerusalem at this point. Okay. They're, they're, they're taking plunder. They're taking all, all the stuff. You know, kind of an extreme um, version of, of what we talked about this morning. Covetousness, you might say. Verse number two, he says, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And you say, I don't, why would he do that? We'll fix the answer to that question in just a moment. And the city shall be taken. And the house is rifled, and the women ravished. And here we see this, this here, it says, And half of the city, so we have 50%, shall go forth into captivity, or taken prisoners of war. Okay. And the residue, or those that are left, so if you got 50 that's taken out. Now, I, I had some terrible math teachers at Baptist High School, folks. I mean bad. Y'all hear me? But even I know that 50% is only half. And that there's 50 left over. Am I right? Okay. That's the residue. 
and the residue of the people shall not be cut off. In other words, or shall not die or shall be delivered. Now, it does not say this here. So just, just don't. But in context of what God teaches through this process, we know, okay, we know that one of the purposes for the tribulation period is to purify the nation of Israel. Okay? And they will turn to him, okay? Getting to that. So 50% of the nation of, excuse me, of Jerusalem survived. Okay. Now, since we're talking about that part of it, time out on verse number two. Look back, just, just a few verses there, to Zechariah chapter 13, verse number eight. This is not just about shall we say, um, Jerusalem in this verse, but again, all of Judah. Right? Verse 8 says, And it shall come to pass that in all the land, the Lord's every bit of it, okay, saith the Lord, two parts therein, two-thirds, shall be cut off and die. So we have actually a higher percentage of those, again, that turn to Christ in the Jerusalem itself. You see, but the third part shall be left therein. Okay, excuse me, it's the opposite way around. It does not. So totally, for the whole nation of Israel, two-thirds of all the Jewish people will die during the tribulation period. From right after the rapture all the way to the end of this battle right here. So it leaves one-third. That one-third that will turn to Christ is all of Israel. Everybody understand that? They will all be saved. All right. They'll, in other words, that they will cease to reject Christ as Messiah. Now, verse number three says of chapter fourteen says, "Then shall the Lord go forth." Now, this is significant here for many different what reasons, right? Because the word "Lord" here, all capital letters here, but this is Jehovah. But this is a statement here. Of, of, of the deity of Jesus Christ. This here, this just this one verse is saying that Christ is God. And again, we see that over and over and over in Scripture, but we need to see it here. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as he fought, as when he fought in the day of battle. Okay? Now, after the immediate, okay, it's just like pushing fast, pushing, pushing your DVR, play button, Christ is in the air. He destroys those armies there in the battle of Valley of Jehoshaphat. He turns and he comes to Jerusalem. Those armies are destroyed. What does it say right there? He says, and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Okay? At the time of Armageddon. Verse number four. Here it goes. Here is where everything's changing. You ever been in a place and, 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 and it's just so stormy and everything is, 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 is dangerous, it's treacherous, it's so dark clouds, there's stuff blowing everywhere, every dish you drive, and all of a sudden, it doesn't take very long, it just kind of clears away, becomes a calmness, and all of a sudden, where did those birds come? But you hear the birds are tweeting. They, I, you know, I never figured out where they go during all those times, but they come around afterwards, don't they? This is what's happening here, folks. Because at this point, at this point, all of Christ's enemies have been defeated completely. Okay. Verse 4 says, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, okay, looking toward Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in other words, it's going to split in half. Shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north. And half of it toward the south. Amen. Now, we look at this and read this. And, and folks, we can't, we can't begin to comprehend. Okay. This cataclysmic under control here as Christ does it and splits this mountain completely. And you might say, boy, I'd like to see that. Well, guess what? 
If you're saved, you're going to see it. You're going to see it, folks. We're going to witness it happen. Moving back here in verse number five says, and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains. Okay. Again, speaking here at this point to those in Jerusalem here with all everything turning loose, so that they're, they're fleeing, they don't understand. Now, I want to stop right there in our, in our reading of Zechariah 14 because we're getting into other things. But I want us to, 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 to look at something here and, 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 and wrap something up here. Genesis chapter 12, God made a promise to Abraham okay, that he would, ultimately this promise is more, of course, than, than just a spot of land that God's going to give them. But God promises there, chapter 15, further on down there in other places, he promises to Isaac later, Okay, He promises to Moses later, but he is telling them that there's going to come a time when Christ himself, the Messiah, actually the terminology at that point in the Old Testament, will literally rule on this earth from Jerusalem. This is what's being promised. This ultimately is, okay, and again the boundaries of the land, all of that's included, but ultimately it's the promise of God of a coming kingdom. A literal 1,000 years. And we're going to, to look at that in depth in the weeks to come. But for tonight, we need to understand that the second coming of Jesus Christ comes, shall we say, with the Battle of Armageddon, with the attack on Jerusalem at that point, and with Christ, yes, feet, on the Mount of Olives. Now, let's, 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 let's draw this in. Let's draw this in. We may come back to Zechariah 14. Hold your place there. But let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 8, Hebrews 11, verse 8, says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, look at the next phrase, not knowing, not knowing whether he went. I'm going to stop there for just a minute. This morning I talked about our, and use the term journey, after salvation, as we, by faith, we trust in the Lord in the things that he commands us to do. We trust in the Lord in the things that he speaks to our heart about, or he burdens our heart about. And we're what? We're being moved toward a place where he wants us. Now understand this. I believe all of us would give testimony to different times whenever maybe God has put something on our heart to do, okay? Or maybe sometimes we may not fully know. We just may have enough of the information to get us started, amen? amen. But you know what? We don't see what's way out there. <clears throat> the Bible is very, very clear that when we get to heaven, the angels are going to stand in awe of us. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Why? Because we believed upon that which we could not see. Faith, folks. Faith. Taking those steps with a knowledge, yes, to a degree, intellectual knowledge. The most important part is a spiritual knowledge yes. that what?
taking those steps as God has spoke to our heart, as God has showed us things that we should do, we should get involved in, take part. This is the, when we can't see way out yonder, but we're trusting between the here and the there. That's what, that's what Abraham was talking about. When he left his land, the Ur of the Chaldees, and left his family behind, and all this, that, and other, God's telling him to get your stuff together. Get over here, because I'm sending you somewhere else. And he's saying here, by faith, Abraham said, okay, well, I'll do it. Now, at this point in Abraham's life, okay, you know, you can't write a, I mean, I'm talking about right there at that point. You can't write a tremendous book and see where Abraham is a tremendous man of faith, but it's in fulfillment of that faith where God made him great among people. Now, listen, when I say great, I'm not talking about a sense of putting somebody up on a pedestal. Listen, any greatness to that degree in him or you and I is God's greatness. It's not us, but it's, 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 it's the power of a holy God. It's in faith and doing. Listen, and I told the guy that rode back, he's a preacher in Mississippi. He was asking me about when God called me to preach. And I know it's September 1980 in New Jersey of all places. I run for 12 years. For 12 years. But one of the things that, that, that God had to deal with my heart about, and one of the things that I had to, to let go of completely is, is that God, no matter what you have for me, I know that you're going to take care of me. And you're going to watch over me. And you're going to provide for me. And you're going to show me how. Teach me how to do the things that I've been telling you for 12 years I can do. Amen. Now, folks, this ain't about me. I'm just giving you that explanation in the sense that what? Every single one of us as his children in our obedience to him every day. That is that journey. Amen. We don't know what's down the road now. That's, that's, hey, listen. My feet may leave the ground before I say amen tonight. And we all say amen, okay? But let's just say it's another 10 years or 20 years. I don't know how, but it can. But listen, don't be caught way back yonder. When by faith, God wants you to move on up here. You say, but nobody during this time period, and nobody in the history of this world has had to do the things and serve God under the circuit. Oh, yeah? Oh, yes, I have. Do you realize that through the Spanish Inquisition, that the number has been floated that 50 million Christians died for their faith. 50 million that the Catholic Church murdered. Beheadings, burning at the stake, skinning alive. Back to Hebrews 11, 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called, to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, and, and he went out not knowing whether he went. Amen. And then look at verse number 10. Well, let's read, go ahead and read 9. It says, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heir with him of the same promise. Verse 10 says, For he looked or was waiting, looking toward. He looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Folks, the second coming is a timed event. It's a rescue mission. Physically, we'll get to the physical part of this as we move, move into the millennial reign. But spiritual rescue mission. It's a gateway event because it ushers in the millennial reign of Christ. That doesn't mean that on the day that his feet that he gets to the mountain, that the, that the clock starts ticking and the thousand years starts. No, there's a period of time here. We'll get into that later. But the one thing that I want to close with tonight in, in, in our hearts 
as we see here, here in Hebrews 11, as we read in Genesis 12, not only is it a time to be, not only is it a rescue mission, not only is it a gateway event, but it's a promise to be. God told Abraham, he says, I'm going to do this. Of you, for you, and through you to be a blessing unto the nations of this earth. Yes. We have realized a portion of that promise in the sense that what? The Messiah, born through that bloodline, died on that old rugged cross for you and I, shed his blood, was, was, was crucified for our sins. We've watched the culmination of promises of promises of prophecy. We've seen in Ezekiel chapter 30, 37, the, the, the valley of dry bone prophecy. We've seen where the nation of Israel has been regathered to their land and how the, how the nation of Israel has, has been recognized um, as, a, as a state in that sense on May the 14th, 1948. Furthermore, in Ezekiel chapter 37, we see where even though they were gathered together nationally as a people and as the flag was flown in that nation for the first time in, in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years the second part of Ezekiel 37 is the battle of dry bones what is they were gathered together physically but they were dead spiritually and at God's appointed time as Christ his son comes back to this earth they will no longer again one third of the nation of Israel will turn to him as Messiah. Folks, there's, there's so much about God's sovereign hand that I don't understand. I mean, I, I'm just in awe. But here's what I do understand. Here's what I know. God says he's going to do it. He's going to do it. As we sit here tonight, before we dismiss, again, thoughts in our mind is, is that you know, I, I, I believe all that. I believe that God's going to, 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 to that Christ is going to come back and, and all this is going to take place. And you know, but what we also need to see is, is what the significance and importance is for us. Is that what? God's going to keep every single promise that he made to Abraham without exception. And without going a long, through a long list of Old Testament saints and New Testament saints, we quickly can, can go to us. When I say us, I'm not right to an In Jesus Christ, God is going to keep every single promise that he made you and I. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, for loving us. We praise your holy name. God, we come for you tonight just... Uh, Knowing with a knowledge, Lord, that we are nothing without you. God, we call upon you, Lord, that as we study, as we read, as we hear your word, dear God, I pray, Lord, that you give us greater and greater understanding. Father, your word tells us that, that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Dear God, that our faith would grow by leaps and bounds, that we be stronger and stronger and stronger in our daily walk with you, in our testimony for you, among those that we'll be working with tomorrow, and those that we will see tomorrow, all these other things. But God, we too, just as Abraham was looking forward to a day, looking toward a time, a city, God, we look forward. <clears throat> To, to, your, to the rapture, God, when you take us off of this earth. We look forward to a time, God, of, of being, Lord, at your throne. Lord, and kneeling and looking upon, Lord, those nail-scarred hands. Oh, God, we praise you. <clears throat> Father, you know every heart here tonight. You know the things, Lord, that you're dealing with our hearts about. Things that... Uh, that you were prompting us to pray about. Father, there be anyone here tonight that's lost. And dear God, I know it's unlikely in this Sunday night group, but God, if there's anyone here that's just not sure, never had you just got it completely settled. For whatever reason, 
Lord, they've not taken that final step. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit communicates in their heart that they're lost, that they're guilty, and that Jesus loves them. That he died on the cross to pay for their sins. And if they will recognize these things by faith, repent of their sins, believe, Father, that your Son, Jesus Christ, died for them by name, personally, their individual sins, and that he paid for them. ask your forgiveness, God, and call upon you to save us all. God, upon the authority of your word, you promise that you will do that. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be 